So over the next um, few segments, I want to talk about um, literary criticism, about uh, history as a discipline, um, and natural science, and ethics as, as different ways of um, reasoning, different kinds of, of methods that you find in these different um, forms of argument. And um, as often, I'm going to start with what Porter says about these things, and then I'm going to add my own um, embellishments to um, kick up the philosophical um, interest a bit. With literary criticism, um, Porter emphasises holism. That's holism without a W. Um, so the coherence of the whole account, all the things you might think of, the psychological, ideological, political, moral, historical, whatever aspects, all have to fit together. So whatever, you're, whatever text you're reading, um, whatever kind of reading you give, all the various aspects, you can't leave, you know, if you, if you make your reading work by leaving, leaving stuff out, then that's cheating, right? And you'll be vulnerable to criticism that way. So um, the more aspects you can, you can take account of, um, the more convincing your reading is. But, and this raises a selection question, of course, um, because the given situation and the background for a given text is, is indefinite. I mean, this is why there's always more books being written about Shakespeare or, you know, whoever, um, because there's always more you can say, there are always more details you can dig up. So you have a selection problem. If you want to, you know, how do you pick out um, the significant elements? Um, and one thing that comes um, straight away in, in Porter's view, I think, is that um, you mustn't have any absolute distinctions. So you can say, well, um, there's the politics and the ethics and um, you know the gender aspect and the um, economics or whatever um, but you mustn't um, you must allow that all of these elements relate to each other you can't um, drive any of these distinctions all the way down so that there's no relation between um, either side of your distinction so that, that connects back to that last thought about um, if it's a real distinction, if it's a genuine distinction, then it should also set up a, a relationship between the things you've just distinguished. That um, seems to be an aspect of the kind of view of literary criticism that, that Porter advances. And formal methods aren't appropriate because they split up um, the, the work into its form and its content. Um, this is this is why if you um, take a kind of recipe approach to literary criticism, you can end up with kind of very boring uh, and ultimately uninsightful. If you're um, if you have a, a, a recipe, if you're if you have some ideological angle that allows you to say something about any book you like, you'll end up saying more or less the same thing about all the books. Um, and so you aren't saying anything much about any of them. About history, Porter says something similar. Um, he says that history seems to be subjective um, because historians and their readers are culturally located, but of course it's constrained by rational standards and evidence. You can't just say anything, and whatever you do say you have to produce evidence for. And that seems right. Um, so one of the decisions you make is what you're going to write a history of. Whether you're to, you might, so Churchill wrote a history of the English-speaking peoples. And that shows you that he thinks the English-speaking peoples form some kind of natural whole. Um, so there's a kind of ideological decision um, at, the, at, the, at the very start of his inquiry. Porter says that history offers um, practical lessons, but according to Hegel, 
who also knew a thing or two about history. Um, his, people never get lessons from history because they just take the lesson that they want to. You know, the field of history is, is vast and you can always um, uh, you can always find something that will support your view. So um, when um, politicians were in favour of um, foreign wars, you know, when we were endlessly marching off to Afghanistan or uh, uh, um, Ira um, Iraq um, or wherever, uh, it was always 1939. Um, it, you know, we were always in danger of missing the point when we um, had to go to war against um, some terrible tyrant. Um, it was always 1939, and the choice was always, are you going to be Churchill or Chamberlain? Um, nobody ever talked about, you know, Aden um, or the Suez Crisis, because these, these would have offered very different advice about um, sending troops abroad. If you've decided in advance that you want to send troops abroad, then um, it's 1939 um, and not uh, any of the other occasions that would recommend you keeping your troops at home. Um, but that cuts both ways, of course. I mean, um, the people who never want to send troops abroad and never want to intervene in anything are always going on about Suez, right? Perhaps it is possible to take lessons from, from history, but uh, um, uh, you need to be more intellectually honest than, 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 is, than is the norm. Collingwood, remember him, I mentioned him a moment ago, R.G. Collingwood, says that all history, this is not, we're beyond Porter by this point, right? This is me. Um, Collingwood says that actions have an inside and an outside. So that's the distinction I was talking about earlier. He goes on to say that all history is the history of thought. What did he mean by that? Well, he didn't mean, he did not mean that the only history that matters is intellectual history, as if um, all human affairs were governed by whatever it is that intellectuals write. No, this is not what he meant. What he meant was that in order to explain a historical event, you have to ask, what were they thinking? What was that person thinking? So Caesar crosses the Rubicon. You have to know what that means in um, Roman political terms. He takes his army across the Rubicon, you know, into Italy. Um, why did he do that? Well, he had a plan. He had a rationale. The world appeared a certain way to Hitler. Hitler? Um, did I say Hitler? I meant Caesar. The world <laughs> um, appeared a certain way to Caesar. Um, and he will have come to a judgment about what to do based on um, his understanding of what the world's like. So it's all about um, his perceptions. What's he thinking? History has to be constantly rewritten, not because the past is changing, but because the present is changing. Because history is an attempt to explain the past to the present. And because the present keeps changing, um, the explanations have to change. So if you imagine explaining Roman history to um, Charlemagne, for example, compare explaining Roman history to Charlemagne with complain, um, explaining Roman history to us. So there are some things that Charlemagne understood better than we do. And Charlemagne was a professional at um, pre-gunpowder warfare. So battles in which people fire arrows at each other and then try and hack each other to pieces. This was his daily work. So those aspects of Roman life he already had a professional understanding of, didn't need um, explanations that might be necessary for us. At the same time, his understanding of leadership is essentially kingship. Um, 
So the idea that something was going badly wrong in the Roman Republic as it slipped from a republic to a dictatorship and then into an empire um, might seem odd to him. Whereas for us, um, we're supposed to believe in democracy. And so the, um, the shift in the Roman Republic from being a republic to being an empire with an emperor with absolute power, um, that strikes us as a kind of decline. History shares the holism of literary criticism. In other words, you explain by adding more detail, by putting things in their contexts. So, um, you know, there's, there's Martin Luther. He um, puts his, uh, his, his theses, he nails them to the door of the church. Um, that seems like a very aggressive thing to do except that um, nailing theses to church doors was kind of normal and this was a church that contained um, a lot of holy relics and since his theses were about um, the place of holy relics in uh, religious life um, suddenly that makes that makes more sense right okay so um, there are some quick thoughts about literary criticism and history. Um, so they seem to be about contextualization and um, adding details and making connections. Um, take a moment to think whether, whether you think that's true, and then I'll say a few words about natural science. Mm -hmm.